committee will come to order. Uh, this is the Subcommittee on TARP Financial Services and Bailouts of Private and Public Programs. Uh, this hearing is entitled Crowdfunding, Connecting Investors and Job Creators. Um, the, uh, it is uh, the practice of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to begin with the mission statement of uh, this committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, with that, I want to thank our witnesses for being here. Um, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Over two years into an uncertain economic recovery, America's labor and capital markets continue to face unprecedented challenges. Nearly 14 million Americans remain officially unemployed, with an additional 11 million underemployed. And small businesses continue to struggle to access capital despite an endless number of Federal initiatives. Fixing this mess will not occur overnight, nor will it be erased by more government regulation. The purpose of today's oversight hearing is simple. In an economic environment in which lending to job creators and entrepreneurs remains dismal, we must find new and modern means for capital formation to ignite our sputtering economy. An existing and innovative means to connect investors and job creators is crowdfunding. Many folks have not heard this terminology before, but crowdfunding is essentially the ability of individuals to pool their money in support of a common cause. Crowdfunding has traditionally taken place in the realm of charity and the arts, but also online communities and social networking, where it could have a very positive uh, implication for America's small businesses and investors. If crowdfunding sounds familiar, because politicians have been doing it for a few generations now, uh, but it has been called something different. Uh, in the 2008 presidential election, then-candidate uh, Senator Barack Obama, through small contributions alone, raised over $100 million. Now, that is quite advanced crowdfunding. Uh, so this makes sense. If crowdfunding can finance a candidate's campaign and really show a, a, a matter of grassroots support for what you are trying to achieve, uh, if if it can make a difference there, then certainly in, uh, under uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, we should be able to permit crowdfunding to empower citizens to invest seed money for American entrepreneurs and innovators. During President Obama's speech last week, I was happy to hear when he said, quote, we are also planning to cut away the red tape that prevents too many rapidly growing startup companies from raising capital and going public. The first thing I thought of when he said that was today's hearing. Uh, but I, I thought, well, of course not. That is not exactly what he is going to be talking about. The next day, when the White House released the, the details of the President's plan in, in bullet point form, I mean sort of the broad brush of it, uh, he used the term crowdfunding. And uh, in, 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 so it is it's very uh, timely that we are having this hearing, and I don't think the White House coordinated with my schedule. Um, but um, I applaud the President for finally recognizing the regulatory red tape has kept American startups from raising capital and hiring workers. Uh, this has never been a secret. Unfortunately, news and information travels a bit slower over at the SEC. Uh, despite recent efforts to relax rules on general solicitation and quiet periods overall, the SEC has resisted calls to modernize securities regulations to meet the needs of today's economy. Um, for instance, recent studies show that most startups use lines of credit such as credit cards or home equity lines to first step, uh, in the first step to finance their business. Uh, the difficulty with this is twofold. Fewer people have access to credit lines or home equity sufficient to start a business. And second, uh, small businesses using a credit card with high interest rates, it makes it tremendously difficult to finance a new business. That is exactly how my dad started his business. Um, but. Um, you know, small th these these ideas um, often don't make it past the dinner table for small businesses. 
we want to make sure that they have this access, this opportunity uh, to get their friends and their neighbors involved in this process. By updating regulation for today's economy, conventional barriers to raising capital can be a thing of the past. As recently as 2009, two ad executives started a crowdfunding campaign called buyabeercompany.com to buy Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer Company. Many po folks call it PBR. Uh, but uh, illustrating the true potential of crowdfunding, they were able to raise over $200 million in pledges from over 5 million individuals through social networking sites such as Facebook. The average pledge was just $40, demonstrating the impact of even small donations. However, the SEC shut it down uh, due to outdated, what I believe are outdated regulations. This example and thousands like it highlight the fact that America does not lack the ideas or creativity to get this economy moving again. It simply lacks access to capital. To rectify this tragedy in American innovation, I introduced the Entrepreneur Access to Capital Act, H.R. 2930, uh, yesterday. This bill simply heeds the President's call to cut red tape for startups and allow everyday investors to connect with entrepreneurs. In today's fast-paced world of innovation and innovators, all Americans, rather than just banks and venture capitalists and so-called qualified investors, high net worth individuals, should be able to invest in the next Google, Apple, Facebook, their local coffee shop, or their favorite beer company. Uh, and I am interested to hear from the witnesses today. I am so happy that we have got such a great panel, uh, and I look forward to your testimony. And with that, I recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Quigley of Illinois, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this hearing for our witnesses being here today. Uh, we are in agreement. Job creation must be the number one priority of Congress. But for businesses to expand and hire new workers, they need resources. They need capital. Unfortunately, billions of dollars in capital are sitting on the sidelines because potential investors aren't confident enough to invest. Investors are wary of investing capital when our growth prospects are so uncertain. As Secretary Geithner said last week, the world economy is in the midst of a second economic slowdown of this recovery from the financial crisis. This is why last month zero jobs were created and the unemployment rate remained over 9 percent. What this means is that we have to consider any and all ideas for raising capital to invest in new businesses and hire American workers. Crowdfunding is one such idea. It is an innovative proposal for raising private capital through the power of the Internet. Crowdfunding uses small investments from often nontraditional investors to fund startup ventures. This is extremely important because these smaller startups often go unnoticed by bigger institutional investors. To the extent that crowdfunding can match ready capital with quality investment opportunities, it will be a success. I believe our witnesses will convince even the skeptics among us that there is enormous potential here for job creation and a stronger, more vibrant economy. Still, even though most of us would use crowdfunding to jumpstart a new tech company or a small neighborhood business, there are legitimate concerns that exempting crowdfunding from securities regulations would open or expand opportunities for fraud. Just as water standards keep our water safe to drink, financial regulations protect us against unsafe financial products. According to SEC Chairman, the SEC Chairman, Shapiro, the SEC has a dual mandate to facilitate capital formation and protect investors. In facilitating capital formation, we must ensure that we do not leave investors vulnerable to fraudulent financial products. That is why the SEC maintains strict registration and disclosure requirements for securities advertised through a general solicitation. In the words of Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Exempting securities from these re registration and disclosure requirements is a decision that cannot be taken lightly. The key is finding the balance between these two objectives of capital formation and investor protection. Crowdfunding might also expose ordinary investors to a level of risk that is unacceptable when not accompanied by standard registration and disclosure. The reality is that many of these startups will fail and cause the investor to lose his or her entire investment. We have to be careful to ensure that investors fully understand the risk of investing in these financial products. My goal today is to find answers to some of these unresolved questions. What is crowdfunding's potential for capital formation and job creation? What is the potential for fraud through crowdfunding? 
What common sense steps can we take to minimize fraud and protect investors? What risk will investors be exposed to through crowdfunding, and are these risks acceptable? What other steps can we take to facilitate capital formation and job creation? I again want to thank the Chairman for calling this timely hearing, and I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. Um, I am going to keep the introductions short since we have such a substantial um, panel. Uh, suffice it to say, we have uh, an academic, we have folks involved in crowdfunding, and then we have uh, uh, a representative from the SEC. So I will go through the uh, introductions, and then we will swear you in, and we will get started with opening statements. Uh, Ms. Meredith Cross is the Director of the Division of Corporate Finance at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Ms. Dana Morello is co-founder and president of Profunder, Profounder, I'm sorry. Mr. Jeff Lynn is chief executive officer of Cedars Limited. Uh, Mr. Sherwood Ness, niece, Lord, I'm sorry, is uh, co-founder of Flavor X. Uh, Mr. Michael, Michael Migliozzi is the managing partner of Forma Migliozzi. You can correct <coughs> me on that. Okay, I'm sorry, I must I had it written down uh, wrong. But um, Professor Mercer Bullard is the associate professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Thank you all for being here. It is the policy of the uh, Oversight and Government Reform Committee that all witnesses be sworn in. So, if you'll please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth? Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Um, so in order to have time for uh, discussion and questions, if you could please keep your uh, opening statement to five minutes. You will see by the uh, lights in front of you, green means go, yellow means woe, and red means stop. Um, woe is a technical term. I am sorry to use that. But uh, we will start uh, first begin with Ms. Cross. You are recognized for five minutes. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to testify on behalf of the Commission on the topics of crowdfunding and capital formation. The SEC's mission is to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. As you know, Chairman Shapiro and I appeared before the Oversight and Government Reform Committee in May to testify on the topic of capital formation. We noted that a critical goal of the SEC is to facilitate companies' access to capital while at the same time protecting investors. Companies of all sizes need cost-effective access to capital to grow and develop, and the Commission recognizes that any unnecessary regulations may impede their ability to do that. At the same time, the Commission must seek to ensure that investors have the information and protections necessary to give them confidence they need to invest in our markets. Investor confidence in the fairness and honesty of our markets is critical to capital formation. To further our goals, a few months ago, Chairman Shapiro instructed the staff to take a fresh look at some of our offering rules to develop ideas for the Commission to consider that may reduce the regulatory burdens on small business capital formation in a manner consistent with investor protection. The staff is in the process of conducting that review and, in doing so, is considering the regulatory questions posed by new capital raising strategies, including crowdfunding. Interest in crowdfunding as a capital raising strategy that could offer investors an ownership interest in developing businesses is growing. As you know, proponents of crowdfunding are advocating for exemptions from Securities Act registration requirements for this type of capital raising activity in an effort to assist early stage companies and small businesses. The staff has been discussing crowdfunding, among other capital raising strategies, with business owners, representatives of small business industry organizations, and state regulators. For example, the staff has met with representatives of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council and from the North American Securities Administrators Association. In addition, we anticipate that crowdfunding will be considered by the Commission's recently announced Advisory Committee on Small and Emerging Companies. Current technology allows small business owners to easily reach a large number of possible investors across the country and throughout the world as a potential source of funding to help grow and develop their businesses or ideas. This source of capital and the ease with which an individual can communicate with potential investors presents an opportunity for smaller companies in need of funds. 
At the same time, an exemption from registration and the investor protections that come from our disclosure requirements also could present an enticing opportunity for the unscrupulous to engage in fraudulent activities that could undermine investor confidence. As a result, in considering whether to provide an exemption from Securities Act registration requirements for capital raising strategies like crowdfunding, the Commission needs to be mindful of its responsibilities both to facilitate capital formation and protect investors. In considering crowdfunding, some of the questions to consider include, should certain minimum information be provided to investors? For example, should investors know the names of the entrepreneurs, a summary of the business plan, how they plan to use the money they raise? Should individuals or firms with a history of securities fraud violations be allowed to use the exemption? Should an SEC notice filing be required so that activities in these offerings could be observed? Should securities purchase be freely tradable? Should websites that facilitate crowdfunding investing be subject to regulatory oversight? While the small amount of any potential crowdfunding investment should generally limit the, the extent of any individual's losses, these are issues that, that are among those that the Commission would need to consider in connection with any future proposal. In addition to looking at new capital raising strategies, including crowdfunding, at the Chairman's request, the staff is also looking at the triggers for when a company has to begin public reporting the restrictions on general solicitation and private offerings, and the rules governing communications in connection with public offerings. My written testimony provides an update on our efforts. We are committed to carefully considering these areas and developing thoughtful recommendations for the Commission, consistent with the goals of facilitating capital formation and protecting investors. Thank you for inviting me to appear here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Ms. Mariello? Uh, my name is Dana Moriello. I am co-founder and president of ProFounder, which I started with my co-founder, Jessica Jackley, who is also the founder of Kiva, one of the first peer-to-peer -peer micro lending sites. We started in August 2009, a platform to allow entrepreneurs to raise investment capital from their communities. One of the case studies that we saw that inspired us to start this business was two of our classmates at the Stanford Graduate School of Business that had a new technology startup that they were, uh, they were beginning, and they were looking to the classmates to see if those classmates wanted to contribute investment capital. We are a very tight community of about 350 students, so we know each other well after two years of being in class together. And within 24 hours, 60 people in that class said they wanted to put in the $1,000 cap that those entrepreneurs had set to invest. This seems like a, a beautiful story, but unfortunately their lawyers let them know that this was impossible, in their words. And when the entrepreneurs pressed, as entrepreneurs tend to do, they found out that it was quote unquote impossible because those investors were unaccredited. We had student debt, we were not, did not meet the accreditation requirements. There were also more people than the, the lawyers felt could contribute. So the entrepreneurs pushed and eventually lawyers came back with Reg D 506, which would allow 35 of those investors to contribute that $1,000 minimum. That answer took four months and $20,000 to achieve. That was an incredible inefficiency that Jessica and I witnessed, and that's what really got us thinking about how could this be possible, that an entrepreneur with a great idea in a community that has the capital and wants to support them would have something standing in the way of being able to meet each other. And looking back at my own personal history with small family businesses, none of them would have gotten off the ground without Uncle Joe, Uncle Gene, and a lot of other friends and family members contributing. So this seemed like a very logical answer. So we started ProFounder with the vision of allowing businesses to access capital and access resources with the support of their community. The solution that we came to after a year of legal research with, uh, with many counsel was Regulation D-504, a securities exemption that allows entrepreneurs to raise the capital if it's less than a million dollars. It's coming from people you have a substantial pre-existing relationship with and you follow state-by-state -state blue sky laws. Here's how we did that. Entrepreneurs came to our platform, created a pitch, they created their term sheets. We offered two term sheet templates, either equity or revenue share, but it could have been anything that was a security. And then we had a compliance calculator that allowed entrepreneurs to say, here are the people who I want to invite, and we would spit out, here are the laws, here are the notice filings, here are the, notice, here are the filing fees that you need to pay. And that was no easy task because these blue sky laws, which are different in every state, are completely interdependent on each other as well. If you have one investor from Connecticut, you can only have 10 investors in Colorado. So that was a bear to both navigate, make a, a technical solution for, and explain to our entrepreneurs. But we did. And we had some amazing success stories that I'm very proud to share. Uh, Bronson and the Chang family in Honolulu, they were able to open their second shaved ice store by raising $54,000 from 19 investors. That included Bronson's freshman year roommate at USC, 
their best customers at the shop, and all of their friends and family. Mark at Cubic Motors was able to start a motorcycle company in San Francisco with the help of his fellow motorcycle enthusiast friends to raise $50,000 from 16 investors that all got these businesses started and off the ground. They are now raising additional rounds of capital. At least two of our entrepreneurs have gone on to raise angel capital now. But we also faced challenges. We faced a lot of challenges. And the one that I'm, I'm most eager to talk about as an expert here is the challenges that these companies like ours that are facilitating crowdfunding face and how those challenges can be alleviated. We were approached by the Department of Corporations of the State of California to investigate our operations, and they came to the conclusion after months of conversation that we needed to be a broker-dealer to be facilitating these transactions on the site because we were providing form templates, because we had term sheets that people could take advantage of on the site. Whatever regulation ultimately goes into place for crowdfunding, I think it is critical to consider what can be done for companies like ours to help facilitate. If we need to be broker-dealers, there is no way that we can help the small entrepreneurs like Bronson and his family's shaved ice shop in Honolulu because the, dis the due diligence requirements on us will be too high and too onerous for us to be able to serve that smaller client who has the greatest potential to really make a difference, create jobs, and spur the economy. Um, furthermore, another problem that we faced was definitions. There was no clear definition for us of friends and family, of substantial pre-existing relationship. There is no definition for us of sophisticated investor. Because of those lack of definitions, it made the law extremely difficult to implement, and it made it very difficult for the counsel of the entrepreneurs that we are working with to get on board and feel comfortable with these changes. In conclusion, thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Mr. Lynn. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, honorable members of this subcommittee. My name is Jeff Lynn, and I am CEO and co-founder of Cedars, a forthcoming equity crowdfunding platform based in London. I am also a U.S. securities and corporate lawyer by background, having practiced with the international firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in both New York and London. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify today on this very important and timely topic. Cedars will allow entrepreneurs to raise up to 100,000 pounds in equity capital from the crowds through an online platform. We like to think of it as Kickstarter with returns instead of donations or Lending Club with equity instead of debt. Details of how the platform works are set forth in my written testimony. We have applied for Cedars to be authorized by Britain's Financial Services Authority, and assuming we are successful, it will be the first equity crowdfunding platform anywhere in the world to be expressly approved by a major securities regulator. We will launch initially in Britain only with the aim of rolling out through the rest of the European Union shortly thereafter. When my co-founder and I designed this model, we examined both the U.S. and Britain as our potential first target market. Both had positives and negatives, but the overriding consideration was that current U.S. securities laws would present an insurmountable obstacle, where securities regulation in Britain is significantly better suited for this type of financial innovation. We are very excited about making crowdfunded equity finance available in Britain and eventually across Europe. Nevertheless, it is highly encouraging to see that some lawmakers want to, want to consider rule changes that would allow equity crowdfunding platforms like Cedars to operate in the U.S. as well. I believe this is a very positive development, as it will open a powerful tool to American entrepreneurs and investors alike and could prove to be a key factor in boosting the economy and creating jobs throughout the country. At the same time, it is important that any rule changes be considered carefully, and in particular that a balance be struck between keeping administrative burdens low enough for these platforms to be viable while still maintaining sufficient investor protections. I have laid out in my written testimony a few thoughts on how best to strike that balance based on our experience in building seeders. I would like to briefly summarize the three main ones here. First, we think it is important that equity crowdfunding platforms be subject to some degree of regulation. This does not need to be highly burdensome. There are categories of regulation currently in existence that small businesses have been able to comply with, such as FINRA broker-dealer registration and SEC investment advisor registration, and those could be used as a starting point, albeit they would need significant adaptation. In the absence of any form of supervision, though, there is too much scope for a crowdfunding platform that lacks sufficient systems and controls to cause harm to investors. And as importantly, many investors simply will not use platforms that lack a regulatory seal of approval. We have been told repeatedly by potential Cedars investors that the fact that we will launch only after becoming FSA authorized is absolutely crucial to their decision to use us. Second, we would be against imposing a limit on how much an investor can invest in a particular startup. These platforms can only function if larger investors are able to participate alongside smaller ones, and a per-investment cap risks unnecessarily excluding larger investors. 
At the same time, there are better ways of making sure that un investors understand the risks involved and do not get in over their heads, such as capping aggregate investment based on the investor's declared net worth and requiring investors to complete a questionnaire showing their understanding of the risks. Cedars will do both of these. Finally, we think that equity crowdfunding platforms will be most effective where they are actively involved in executing the investment transaction and managing the investment after completion. The greatest risk to investors when investing in a startup comes not when the startup fails, but rather when it succeeds. Any sensible investor knows and accepts that the odds are significant that the business will not work out and there will be no return of capital. However, if the startup succeeds, but due to a flaw in the way the investment was structured or, or managed, the investor does not get the benefit of that success. That is a much bigger problem. This is why Cedars will provide a substantial level of intermediation as part of its service, including legal due diligence, subscription agreement negotiation, and post-completion management. We expect that other successful platforms are likely to do the same. We do not think that these services need to be required by law, but it is important that whatever set of rules is adopted for crowdfunding, they at least allow for and perhaps even explicitly authorize a meaningful level of intermediation. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, I am both encouraged and excited by the prospect of equity crowdfunding becoming a reality in the U.S. I hope the thoughts and insights I have shared from our experience will prove helpful as consideration of rule changes moves forward. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I would welcome the chance to respond to your questions or to amplify or clarify these statements at any time. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Mr. Nees. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing today and allowing me to share an entrepreneur's perspective on how crowdfund investing will spur innovation among your constituents, create jobs, and help our economy grow. This framework was just endorsed by President Obama in the American Jobs Act. My name is Sherwood Neese, and I am an entrepreneur who started and sold the three-time Inc. 500 company and is trying to raise capital for two more. This is my third time I have given congressional testimony on the hurdles related to formation, capital formation for entrepreneurs and small businesses. This testimony was written in conjunction with my co-founders of the Startup Exemption, Jason Best, a two-time Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Zachary Cassidy-Dorian, and Karen Kerrigan of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. I am going to discuss three things. First, how crowdfund investing solves the problem of connecting entrepreneurs to capital. Second, the framework under which we suggest this should take place. And third, provide two examples. As someone who has tried to raise capital in the past few years, I know how hard it is. Try going into a bank to get a loan or a line of credit. Try finding a credit card company that will give you a decent interest rate. Or try peddling your idea to venture or private equity. They aren't focused on who will create the majority of net new jobs, but who has the greatest chance for a 10x return in the shortest period of time. So the point is, there is no capital out there for the majority of businesses. We need to hire Americans and get us out of this recession. A solution is crowdfund investing. Crowdfund investing is using equity to pool small amounts of capital from a large number of Americans to start and expand businesses. Crowdfunding is nothing new to America. The Statue of Liberty was even built thanks to thousands of small donations from Americans. On crowdfund investing sites, entrepreneurs will pitch their ideas, investors and investors will decide which ideas they think are worthy of backing. If a startup doesn't hit its funding target, no money is exchanged. The funding rounds will occur via SEC-regulated websites where entrepreneurs will be vetted and their ideas discussed freely with other investors. Anyone with deceptive practices and false moves will be documented and discussed by the thousands on Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms. Time and again, we see if you make a false move on the Internet, it will only take hours before millions of people know about it. Successfully funded businesses will not only benefit from the capital, but the collective knowledge, experience, and marketing power of the people who have a vested interest in making sure the entrepreneur succeeds. Successful businesses will also create jobs. The complete rules of our framework are, on my, are in my written testimony, but here are six main points. First, we propose the, the creation of a funding window of up to $1 million for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Second, investors would have to acknowledge that the risk involved in this type of, of, the, the risk involved in this type of investment at their, and that there is no guarantee of return. Third, once they acknowledge the above, they can choose to invest. However, investments via this window would be limited to $10,000. Fourth, because of the size of the crowd and the anticipated small dollar amounts invested, we propose eliminating the 500 investor rule as well as broker-dealer license requirements. Fifth, due to the limited size, these offerings should be exempt from costly state registration. And sixth, general solicitation should be allowed only on registered Internet platforms where entrepreneurs, investors can meet, and people and ideas can be vetted by the crowd. 
Standardized based reporting will be used to submit information to the SEC about small businesses utilizing these platforms. CFI is being used in other countries successfully, including the U.K., France, Hong Kong, and China. Over the last five years, over $300 million has been donated on U.S. crowdfunding type sites for art-related projects or entrepreneurs in the developing world. Just think what could have been accomplished if we used those same dollars to fund jobs and innovation in the United States. Here are two examples of where people have donated money to, help, to support an entrepreneur. Imagine how many more companies could, we could fund if these same investors were given the potential for a return on their investment. Three engineers created a product that greatly improved mobile video cameras. They were turned down by 43 VCs and banks, so they created a short video on a website and solicited money via their Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook communities. They raised over $24,000 and are now selling their products, creating jobs, and have gained, investor, uh, gained interest from VCs. And Brooke from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, wanted to expand from a small T-shirt kiosk into a larger store, but was unable to raise capital through traditional means. So she created a video and raised $15,000. Now she has a standalone store and has hired more employees. These are just two stories, but thousands are waiting. Based on estimates from the SBA and the Kaufman Foundation, we believe CFI can generate over 500,000 companies and over 1.5 million net new jobs over the next five years. Americans should be allowed to invest in their communities. Today, technology makes this a possibility. The Internet, with its transparency and accountability, will make this concept thrive. In turn, the crowd will fund the ideas they believe in, and these ideas will be the launching pad for thousands of worthwhile businesses. Both parties agree on the importance of getting capital to our entrepreneurs. Our framework is a zero government cost proposal to accomplish it. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Migliozzi. Uh, good morning, and uh, good morning, and thank you, uh, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the committee. My name is Michael Migliozzi. I am the Creative Director and Managing Partner of Forza Migliozzi, an advertising and brand content agency. I am honored to have my presence requested by this body for any assistance, regardless of how small, that I am able to contribute with ideas to unleash your, our economy, leading to job creation and financial recovery. I am without question absolutely humbled to contribute what experience I have. Uh, from my earliest memories, my father told me that America is the land of the opportunity, uh, that you can become whatever you want to become. Through hard work, you will succeed. I am passing this on to my two little girls. I chose advertising. I have had the unique opportunity to work with some of the smartest, pioneering, dream chasers and passionate people in business. As an ad man, it is as though I am part psychologist, part bartender, part clergy. It is my work to sell their work. My career path has taken me all around this great nation, Northwest, East, and South, working for some of the best advertising agencies in the world, from New York City to Portland, Oregon, creating campaigns for sneakers, soda, sports teams, credit cards, casinos, hotels, beer, and many other categories. For an ad man, the struggle and battle is to get to the reward of the big idea, the 24-7 quest to solve the problem at hand is never ending. I came to realize that this is the struggle of the entrepreneur as well, a 24-7 cycle of commitment to your dream the risk that might never see a reward, uh, the fight uh, to battle or fear of failure or maybe <clears throat> to look failure in the face and tell it to take a hike. So a few years back, I took my own advice and became an entrepreneur by opening my own advertising agency. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to get on to crowdsourcing. What is crowdsourcing? The best definition I've ever found. Excuse me. Uh, give me a moment. What is crowdsourcing? The best definition I've ever found. I'm going to have to pass for a moment. We'll come back to you to finish up, if that's all right. And if you need some more water, we'll. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do you want some water, please? Mr. Bullard. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the regulation of crowdfunding. I would like to start by laying out the structure of securities regulation in order to put crowdfunding regulation in context. Securities transactions are generally regulated on three levels. On the first level, securities transactions are subject to the same general commercial anti-fraud provisions that apply to all businesses. On the second level, securities transactions are subject to securities-specific anti-fraud provisions that provide increased investor protection. There is some general agreement that crowdfunding triggers the first level, first two levels of regulation, which provides some degree of investor protection. On the third level, securities transactions are subject to public registration or reporting requirements, and this is where crowdfunding runs into trouble. 
Public registration and reporting requirements are generally impracticable for crowdfunding. In fact, many issuers find them to be impracticable. Congress and the SEC have created a variety of exemptions from public registration and, report and primary public registration requirements, but these exemptions are also impracticable for many forms of crowdfunding. And the most significant problems are generally that some form of disclosure document is required and there is a general prohibition against solicitations and advertising in connection with the sale of securities. So the regulatory question as to crowdfunding is whether it would be appropriate to liberalize one or more existing exemptions or create a new exemption to accommodate crowdfunding. I think that the answer should be yes for the archetypal crowdfunding program. This would be offerings in which investors, individual investments, were limited to a small amount, $100 or $250. The total amount of the offering did not exceed, for example, $100,000. For such de minimis investment amounts, registration and reporting requirements should not apply. Other requirements should be imposed, including enhanced requirements for crowdfunding broker-dealers to combat the heightened risk of fraud. Other types of crowdfunding, macro crowdfunding finance, macro finance crowdfunding, if you will, raise very different concerns. A $10,000 investment, for example, is not a de minimis amount. It is a significant amount for many investors and should be subject to some degree of registration and reporting, making it much easier for scam artists to sell unregistered securities to families living below the poverty line or to seniors barely surviving on Social Security is usually not good public policy. Any macro finance crowdfunding exemption should be subject to the regulatory cost-benefit analysis traditionally used to evaluate registration and reporting requirements. This cost-benefit analysis generally considers the increased risk of fraud and the benefits to capital markets and to investors. It also considers the relationship of any new exemption to existing exemptions and the interests of all issuers, not solely those of crowdfunders. There are areas where reform is needed and macrofinance crowdfunding would be easier. Increasing the Reg A limit to $50 million is an example of one where I don't believe there would be that much dispute. But let's not do that to make crowdfunding easier. Let's do that to make Reg A work better for all types of capital raising. Similarly, the 500 investor trigger for reporting obligations, the ban on general solicitation and advertising, and the qualifications for accredited investors all need to be reformed, but not to accommodate macrofinance crowdfunding. They need to be reformed to accommodate the full range of issuers. The 500 investor trigger is routinely honored in the breach. Firms with thousands of beneficial owners are often permitted to cease public reporting, and at the same time other firms with thousands of beneficial uh, owners are never required to public, file public reports in the first place. The ban on general solicitation and advertising is fundamentally inconsistent with the information age. The frenzied and very public trading of Facebook's two and a half billion shares makes a mockery of this prohibition, as did the failure of the U.S. segment of a Facebook private offering earlier this year. The wealth and income tests for accredited investors have not been adjusted for 20 years, and they are structurally nonsensical. A young investor with $900,000 cannot put 10 of it in a hedge fund. But a retired auto worker with a million-dollar portfolio living on, say, $40,000 a year that the portfolio generates can drop the whole million in a hedge fund. The investor who can afford to lose his shirt cannot invest, but the investor who cannot afford to lose his shirt can. In conclusion, there is microfinance crowdfunding that simply does not implicate the public policy concerns underlying the third level of securities regulation registration and reporting. But exemptions for other small issuers where investors are risking more than de minimis amounts are appropriate only to the extent that the cost of increased fraud, if any, is outweighed by the benefits. Thank you again, and I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Bullard. Uh, Mr. Migliozzi, we will return to you with uh, about, if you can just summarize, I think we are no, about I'm three fine. or four minutes left for you. If you could I have just... four minutes. I will take that. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, I will pick up, if I may, uh, with regards to uh, the entrepreneur. Um, so a few years back, I, did, I took my own advice and became an entrepreneur by opening uh, my own advertising agency. I now share the same challenges, the same roadblocks that many entrepreneurs face, regardless of size, purpose, or industry. My business is wholly dependent on other businesses' need to sell their product or services. They dependent on an end consumer to sell to, the consumer a paycheck to spend with. As we have seen, the cycle or the gears of this cycle have locked up. Crowdsourcing and advertising. What is crowdsourcing? The best definition I have ever found goes something like this. It is a neologistic compound of crowd and outsourcing 
for um, the act of taking tasks traditionally performed by an employer or contractor and outsourcing them to a group of people <clears throat> or community through an open call to a large group of people, a crowd asking for contributions. Apparently, I have been doing this for quite some time. We will go on to buy a beer. This is fun. In the fall of 2009, I read a uh, Just take your time. We're, it's okay. All right. I am having an allergic reaction to medication. I am sorry. I know that is very convenient for the day you are having. So huh? sorry. I know it, uh, it, having an allergic reaction is very convenient for testifying before Congress. Yes. I mean, I will finish it. No, I, no, I, no. I say that with sarcasm, but um, okay, let just, me, let, just we'll take your time. We're no, it is fine. Dude. In the fall of 2009, I read a New York Post article that Pabs Brewing Company was up for sale and uh, the asking price was $300 million. And Jess, via our corporate Twitter account, I tweeted, maybe we can crowdsource uh, this. And before I could even hit the send button, I knew this would be, at the very least, a great case study to evaluate crowdsourcing, its behavior, its magnitude. My expertise is not finance, economics, nor law. My expertise is in effective branding, marketing, consumer behavior, and possibly a little sideshow, regardless of medium. I am not here to confirm nor deny any of the findings of the Securities and Exchange Commission's cease and desist order. I was asked to be here to recount the important aspects of my experiment <clears throat> as it relates to funding companies without traditional financial outlets and to highlight the success it had, not in theory, but in actuality. Uh, crowdsourcing means crowdfunding. This experiment was to answer my questions about crowdsourcing. With such a large amount, a $300 million asking price, it would qu require the crowdsourcing vehicle to be easily partaken by all, exclusively online. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. The goal was to be stated as the focal point. A countdown starting at a mind-boggling $300 million maybe not so mind-boggling as we were hearing about trillions of dollars every day, but a very large amount just the same. What was being asked of them, their interest to join in the largest ever crowdsourced audience, that was their, their interest came in the form of <clears throat> pledging their name, email address, and a non-binding amount they were pledging, and in caps, send no money. It is important for me to state here that at no time was any money ever received, nor was there any way for users to send the money, nor any way for us to collect money. How to create enough buzz to get this into the hands of others would, take, uh, uh, would be re required. How long could the buzz be sustained? How would the user take control of the conversation to generate buzz? Transparency. Any questions and their answers needed to be anticipated and answered by viewing the site. Of course, the onset of the experiment, there was simply no way to predict a positive outcome, outcome far too many variables. A one-page website is created with full disclosure, a Twitter account created, a press release circulated, this on or about November 10, 2009. By December 1, 2009, uh, over $14.75 million was pledged. I am getting into the red, if I may ask for uh, additional time. <clears throat> the amount of press, press about the concept, the ease of understanding, the genius of the experiment generated buzz, traffic, sharing that by uh, the end of 2009, the amount of pledges had exceeded $100 million. Christmas and New Year's passed. I was certain with the, the new year this would be old news. By February 22, 2010, over $200 million was pledged. What was just an experiment was now taking up far too much of my time with press requests, some 150 articles written, radio interviews by that point. There was an interest by media users, et cetera, that this could happen. Could it? How? What steps would need to be taken? Pledges were still coming in. Press was still writing about this. This experiment was turning into a solid case study, an award-winning one at that, as it won for most innovative in the crowdsourcing competition at South by Southwest in 2010. <clears throat> On March 24, 2010, I received a FedEx uh, from the SEC, which led to the shuttering of buyabeercompany.com. Those prece proceedings concluded on June 8, 2011. Pabst Brewing was purchased on May 26, 2010 for about $250 million, according to the Wall Street Journal, by investor C. Dean Metropoulos. At the time of closing buyabeercompany.com, over $282 million was pledged by over 7 million users, averaging $38 per pledge. 
my conclusion is coming. I believe, in, I believe this illustrates the power of crowdsourcing, or as it is referred here specifically as crowdfunding. Uh, what a powerful tool whereby the investor now becomes purchaser, brand steward, evangelist, where the brand must answer to them and live up to their every expectation, not as a simple financial tool, but as their expansion of buying into the brand. This process could have been easily used for the sale of Hummer. Uh, GM, as seeking to shed their division, was selling this American icon to China. While that $150 million fell through, I, I can't help but imagine if crowdfunding couldn't have not only saved this brand, but the jobs, the dealerships, the money spent on R&D, the equity built into the marketing and brand loyalty by simply opening, opening this up to the general public. What had started out as an experiment to test the hypothesis of the power of social media and the propelling of a crowd toward a common goal had become a concrete and plausible way to do business in a landscape which moves rapidly and without harness. For my purpose, my purpose is it gave me invaluable information on consumer behavior. Hopefully other aspects of this can provide light on how we can utilize this to fund, build, expand businesses, the economy uh, leading to job creation. The possibilities of crowdfunding for starting, expanding, and purchasing companies are never ending. Thank you. Thank you. And I uh, understand the uh, <coughs> pressure of testifying and at the same time having a, a, a health issue as well. So uh, we certainly understand that. I will begin my question. I will recognize myself for five minutes. Votes have been <coughs> called on the floor, so we are going to try to get through our first round of questions and come back for more. Um, Ms. Cross. Um, the President outlined in his speech and then the administration issued the following, reducing regulatory burdens on small business capital formation. The administration also supports a, quote, crowdfunding, end quote, exemption from SEC registration requirements for firms raising less than $1 million with individual investments limited to $10,000 or 10 percent of the investor's annual income, and raising the cap on many offerings, Reg A, that Mr. Bullard uh, testified about from $5 million to $50 million. This will make it easier for entrepreneurs to raise capital and create jobs. Can you uh, describe the SEC's perspective on the President's um, recommendation uh, in terms of the crowdfunding portion, not the Reg A, but uh, if you could describe uh, the SEC's perspective on this? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I have to say first that the Commission hasn't taken a position yet. The, these statements were just made, so we are um, discussing the matter internally at the Commission. I am sure we will be having um, more discussions uh, in light of the interest in the topic. Um, from, from my personal perspective, I think that the key to uh, such an exemption would be whether it could be crafted uh, so that there could be a, a cost-effective crowdfunding um, exemption that could be, uh, that, that wouldn't present significant concerns of fraud. The, um, if so, then I could see real benefits. Uh, the, the issue you got to watch out for is that if it becomes a, uh, viewed as a tainted market where, where people go to um, fraudulently steal money, um, then that won't help anyone. And so there needs to be some sort of balancing happening on a cost-effective basis where the, the um, some level of, of requirements, um, you know, what kind of information might be required, are there notice filings, things of that nature, what the caps are, um, how much money for any individual, all those kinds of issues will be important so that this isn't a place where just bad, bad actors go to, um, to steal money from, from people. Okay. Um, and so uh, would an annual audit be uh, one of those considerations? I, you know, that is an interesting question. I don't know that an audit is, is what, what I would be thinking of. I, I was thinking more in terms of, of oversight of those operating the site so that at least someone is keeping track of um, that these companies actually exist, that the money is coming you know, from investors to these companies, those sorts of things that, that would give you a pause if somebody just opened up a website so and took money and then disappeared. That would be pretty awful. Um, so what, you're, what I was thinking which, of is which, uh, not not to use sarcasm, but which never happens today. Well, I I I, I can't say whether it happens today or not. Really? I so I mean, it, so I would I would just pose this. So uh, based on this, the SEC would think that the eBay exchange, where I offer uh, my used pickup truck for sale, uh, that that transaction would never happen without the SEC. 
preserving and protecting against fraud? Uh, I am not asking you to answer, but uh, what, what is the time frame for the SEC to review this recommendation, and, uh, and how long would that take to implement? Um, you know, we are currently discussing it internally. I don't have a time frame, but I would expect that we would want to um, consider it um, you know, deliberately um, in the near future. Is that two years? Is it one year? Is it six months? Um, I, I, as I said, I can't commit the Commission to a particular time frame, but I would expect that it would be um, in the near future. Back in May, I asked uh, a similar question about uh, accredited investors, the, four, the 500 investor cap. Uh, any update there? Yes, we are um, uh, deep into the various work streams that we discussed back in May. Um, one of them is the 500 shareholder cap. We have a study underway at the Commission now to get all the data that we need in order to be able to determine what, um, what revisions to the cap there should be. Um, so that is deep underway right now. And we also are working on um, the, the concept release on how to address the issues with regard to the ban on general solicitation and looking at targeted offering reforms um, around uh, quiet period issues. And in addition, we just announced this week um, the formation of our small um, and emerging company advisory committee so we can get their input as well. Uh, what was the impetus for, for creating that group? For the committee, we have been working on forming the committee. It is complicated to form committees under the advisory um, committee rules. Uh, the purpose of it is to get, is to be able to try out ideas. I understand the purpose, but what, what was the impetus for creating it? In order to be able to get the, I am sorry, we have been in the process of forming it since, um, you know, many months ago. Okay. Okay. Do we have a time frame for when this uh, 500 investor cap will, there will be some resolution to it? Um, I would say because we have to do the study to get the data that we need to, to do an appropriate analysis, it will, it will take um, you know, a significant period of time, maybe sometime in 2012. Okay. Uh, Mr. Quigley is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lynn, make sure I get this right. You had talked about allowing a dual set of investors, the high end as well as the low. Are, are you talking about uh, the high end ones? being under the normal rules or also under crowdfunding? No. We, on our platform, they will all be under the exact same set of rules. <clears throat> Everybody will come in through the platform, whether they are investing 10 pounds or 10,000 pounds or 100,000 pounds directly through the platform. The key point, just to try to elucidate slightly you know, why it is important that we have the big investors alongside the smaller ones, is that Platforms like this will not succeed if it is only $10, $100 investments being made through them. What will happen is a business that is seeking capital you know, will get a lot of interest. There will be a high volume of investors. But to try to raise $50,000, $100,000 on the back of $10 or, 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 or similar sized investments, they simply, the deal simply won't get closed. So for these platforms to function, for a marketplace to exist, we think that we need to be able to go after both the smaller investors, but also people who might traditionally be angels but see a value proposition in investing through a platform like ours alongside the smaller investors. Why can't you um, do this in a system, a dual system for the same sort of investment? Well, I mean, the whole point of the high-end investors having so much more regulation and control is because you are dealing with a lot more money. Uh, I mean, at least it is one of the elements of this. Don't you now run the risk? Why would anybody go under the normal rules if they can all, the big ones can go under crowdfunding and it is well, I, you know, two, two answers. I mean, first is, yes, you, you could do two separate systems, absolutely. Uh, you could do a system where the smaller investors receive an additional level of protection um, uh, and, the, and the larger investors do something on a different track or different plane. It just adds administrative complexity and there is no particular reason when you could have everything under the same system where effectively, you know, and as I have said in my testimony, you know, we are looking at a platform where all investors get a much more significant level of protection than they would if they just went off and bought shares in their friend's company. Uh, the second point is, you know, investing through a platform like ours has both advantages and disadvantages to high net worth investors. Uh, the advantage is it is simple, it is easy and straightforward, and they don't have to do a lot of administrative work. Many angels, though, prefer to be able to invest in a hands-on way, to be able to interact directly with the, in, with the entrepreneurs, to be able to go on the board, provide advice. And we think that many angels will continue to want to use uh, the traditional offline method of, of investing uh, as well. And we want the choice to be there for them. Ms. Cross, uh, we are on limited time because we are 
do on the floor a few minutes ago. Uh, how do you begin to balance this? I mean, you talked about the notion of at least having some rules about this, uh, and you ticked off quite a few points. But at what point are you right back to where we are now anyway with all the rules and regulations that the President sort of referred to that we want to uh, pull away so that we encourage this kind of investment at the small level? That is a very um, important question, and I think any rulemaking <clears throat> would have to have an appropriate uh, balancing of the costs and the benefits. I think that the, the smaller the amount of money that people could risk losing, the less um, uh, regulation you would need, um, the, the less impact it could have across the markets. For Let me interrupt you, because, again, because we are short. The, I guess the crux of my concern is that the smaller investor, doesn't it seem like that is the less sophisticated, less knowledge, less ability, perhaps, perhaps the very person who needs the most protection? I mean, is that a glimmer in your mind, or is that, is that just wrong? Well, that is certainly a concern, and, and you would need to think about that. I think the, the notion of crowdfunding, which, again, I, the Commission has not taken a position on, but the notion of it is that at some de minimis level, one, one would argue that there isn't a need for um, the full panoply of regulations that comes from securities registration, even though the, the particular people may be on the less sophisticated range because they have less to lose. And the, and the question really, it is a cost-benefit analysis. I think it is important, though, that, that if it turns out all those unsophisticated investors who don't get the information registration would require end up defrauded, then it is going to be an, an unsuccessful experiment. If, if instead it is a, it's a success, and um, then I think it does provide an opportunity for, this is my personal view, for um, uh, another avenue to raise money cost effectively. But, but it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a, an interesting experiment that we would need to at least keep a, a close eye on. Mr. Chairman, these are thoughts that I would like to get the thoughts of all the uh, participants. Unfortunately, we are now heading to the floor. Uh, and the Chair would announce that uh, we have votes on the floor. It is the intention of the Chair to go cast the first vote, return back here. Um, try to get a few more uh, rounds of questioning in, at which point we will have two additional votes thereafter. Uh, there are members that will be sworn in be between the first and second vote here, so we should be able to get back and well, have uh, an additional 30 minutes. What point of and information, so, Mr. Chairman? May, may I ask my question and make a, a you know, uh, uh, bolt to the floor? Uh, well, Because <laughs> I, I don't think I can come back, and well, it is a serious I'm, one. Yeah, I, um, I, 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 would just ask the indulgence of, of the member to, to come back after this first series of votes because it's really we plan hard. To be can here. I just do it really quick right now? I've I've got to get to the floor and vote so I can get back here. Go, go ahead. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the gentle lady a minute. Okay. I'll give the gentle lady. Uh, first, a I want to thank you for for holding this uh, this hearing. It's uh, tremendously important Wonderful. and uh, uh, looking at the crowdfunding exemption and how it's implemented. An author, a uh, startup mentor, an angel vest investor in the district that I represent by the name of Marty Zwingling wrote an interesting blog calling into question some of the virtues of crowdfunding. And I would like to quote what he said, and I quote, um, he warns that crowdfunding uh, places the focus on the product, not the business model. When pitching to consumers online or offline, the feedback will likely be on features and design. The key success factors of the business model, meaning how you make money, management expertise, and financial projections, will likely get overlooked. And that's the end of his quote. And I'd just like to know how the panel would respond to what he said. He also warns that investors are not prepared for the high risk of startups, and uh, and he has uh, he believes that it will be marketing to the riskiest, most speculative investments to some of the least sophisticated. And so I would like to hear your response. And Gentlelady's time has expired. We have uh, just enough time for me to get to the floor, for okay. us to get to the floor to vote. When we return, I will let the panel answer that question. Uh, the committee is in recess.
Committee will come back to order. Um, we do have uh, two new members uh, that won special elections on Tuesday being sworn in on the floor today, uh, right now at this moment. So um, we, we have some time to have additional rounds of questions, and uh, so I will recognize myself. Um, well, actually, I will let the panel answer uh, my colleague, Ms. Maloney's question, um, which pertains to fraud. If you could begin with that, uh, if you can recall, uh, her question from, you know, 15 minutes ago. Ms. Gross, and we'll just go right down the panel. Yeah, I'll just quickly respond. I think that her question points out the, uh, the point about whether investors will have access to the kind of information that they need, whether it's focused on the idea or the company in which they would be investing. And so whether that's through the rules of the platform or any other regulations, what kind of information would be needed at a minimum is, is an important issue. How would the SEC deal with that? I think it, 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 it depends on um, uh, the costs and benefits. I think at, you know, the lower levels of investing, um, fewer requirements may, may make sense. Higher levels, you would think perhaps you would need more robust disclosure requirements. All right. So it, just to address the general issue of fraud, the idea has come up from numerous people about broker dealership or the responsibilities of the facilitating party to do something. And um, Chairman McHenry, I think you brought up a good analogy with eBay, that if I am going to buy a car on eBay, I am not going to ask eBay to verify that the seller of that is legitimate. I am going to look at the reviews. I am perhaps going to call, get references, and use reputation. So this issue of fraud is certainly not a new one that we are facing with the idea of crowdfunding. It is a very old idea and one that has been well tested and well proven what the solutions can be online and proven that those solutions are more based around reputation and based around crowdsourcing information than on the facilitating party. So, for example, if we had been a broker-dealer at the time that some of these deals had gone through on our site and had to do due diligence, um, for example, I would have had to call to do reference checks the very same people who were doing the investments in the deal in the first place. They had much more information than I did at that particular time. Mr. Lynn? I mean, I think I agree with Dana, and I think an important point as well about fraud generally is it is in the interest of every one of these platforms like ours uh, to do everything we can to minimize the levels of fraud that occur, because it is bad for the market. If this becomes, as Ms. Cross said, as, as this, if this becomes an environment in which sort of bad or fraudulent companies see this as a way to raise money, I am out of business. So there is, you know, whatever the regulation may be, we have a tremendous incentive, and we have with Cedars put in place a number of very significant protections to try to limit that. Also, just quickly to address Congresswoman Maloney's point about investors not being sufficiently sophisticated or not understanding what they are getting into. Now, I firmly disagree with that. I think that while we do have a level of screening on the test to make sure that truly vulnerable people do not invest through the platform, it is not that hard to understand that investing in startups is a very high risk, highly illiquid form of asset. And we think that a wide range of people are capable of and qualified to do so. I concur with that. I think uh, Congresswoman Maloney was talking about people focusing on the product and the business model. I just don't get why we have to keep on pushing people down with a relentless assault on their intelligence. I mean, we are pretty smart people. I am going to be partaking in these platforms. I have money tied up in, in an investment group. I know how to ask questions and I know how to educate other people that will be investing as well. So by people like me partaking in this, we are just going to be educating more people, which is going to raise the bar and make it even safer for everyone. Uh, I come from the same position as yourself as far as eBay is concerned. I look at state lotteries. A dollar in a dream is probably one of the best, best taglines in New York State and known many, many years. Um, we, and, and most of those people funding the lottery are not exactly sophisticated investors, nor are they sophisticated investors in casinos. Now, they are all hoping to gain. What we are doing, at least from what I am understanding here, is we are preventing people from the possibility of huge opportunities to either elevate themselves up, whether it is a small amount of money or a large amount of money, um, and preventing them of uh, making this what we have, the land of opportunity, is now protecting you from fraud uh, and therefore curtailing any possibility of getting yourself involved in a crowdfunding or a startup or riding it all the way up. Um, the, the answer to the, to the eBay question, which, which is a good question, is really a structural one. Uh, the answer is that if we are uh, going on 100 years, 
legislators and regulators have treated securities transactions differently from other transactions. If they are not different, we should repeal the Federal securities laws. But this isn't a matter of crowdfunding regulation. That is fundamentally a matter of whether securities transactions are different, and I think they are. Um, as to whether, for example, private offering uh, uh, requirements that you have accredited investors are an assault on the intelligence of Americans, um, again, it is so deeply embedded in the structure of the Federal securities laws to, to make paternalistic judgments about who is going to be allowed to invest in unregistered offerings. Uh, the idea that that is somehow just fundamentally questionable uh, is not a crowdfunding issue. That is an attack on the very structure of the Federal securities laws. And maybe that is the way Congress wants to go, but let us not pretend it is anything other than what it is. It also shows, I think, you know, the, the ignorance of people who are you know, running good faith businesses and want to raise capital with respect to the amount of fraud that goes on on the Internet and specifically with respect to securities. And there is no question that any, any liberalization of the exemption rules will result in some incremental increase in fraud. And you know, no one likes to say it except for someone who is somewhat of a free agent, but regulation is about figuring out what the optimal level of fraud is. And you are going to get a lot of fraud. And if the bill, which I appreciate, you know, starts the conversation, um, is as written, made into law, uh, you will have a massive amount of fraud. And I can tell you, your crowdfunding market will cease to exist, because the level of fraud will simply destroy any confidence in anyone other than uh, a, a lack, an unsophisticated investor uh, would be willing to participate in. Um, so you know, there is a level of discussion that we are just not recognizing here. It is about some of the fundamental assumptions about how securities uh, uh, transactions are regulated. And if that is what you object to, I think we need to put that on the table and have a conversation about that. All right. I recognize myself for five minutes. I thank you for answering that question. Uh, Ms. Cross, is, is this the, the number one concern is fraud? Um, um, that, that's certainly a, a very important concern. I, uh, we're not talking about regulating just for regulating's sake. Um, the what are the key concerns? Uh, well, the key concern would would be that um, uh, that investors would would part with their money to uh, unscrupulous uh, business uh, operators who just take the money and run, um, and and that we all watched that happen and didn't didn't. Um, take the time and, and effort needed to come up with a, a system that would provide a level of, of disclosure, um, safety, and disclosure um, oversight, um, some ability to watch what is going on. I think you okay. know, I, I worry about, as I mentioned, websites popping up all over the place and then disappearing, and people put in money and then it is gone. And um, I think th those are the concerns that I would okay. have. Okay. Um, so, uh, for instance, as a former wise investor in Pets.com, uh, this has happened with registered securities, where the business plan was bad. Um, and, uh, and so how do we, Mr. Bullard, in your opinion, how do we ensure that uh, we, we open this area? It sounds like th that, that you are willing to go with the idea of crowdfunding with some exemption. How do we do that while at the same time uh, dealing with that question, that concern of fraud. Well, you know, I think that the the analogy to Pets.com is a very apt one because you know we are sort of revisiting the way we have structured the federal securities laws, and it comes down to the question of you know how much paternalism are we going to have? Because it, it, I would have to disagree with Ms. Cross. It's really not about getting information into investors' hands, because the way securities laws work is. There is no amount of information you get into some people's hands that is going to allow us to allow them to invest. It is a prophylactic rule. It is not a do you have enough information, because a lot of these people simply, no matter how much information you give them, the Federal securities laws have decided they are not going to be allowed to invest in certain offerings. Pets.com jumps through a bunch of hoops, but there are still people who lose their shirts, sophisticated or otherwise. So I think the answer is you have got to draw that line and say, for example, at a de minimis level, you are making a decision that we are going to allow a lot of losses to go on. We are also going to allow an increase in fraudulent losses, not just people investing in pipe dreams, but good faith pipe dreams. We are also going to be allowing people to lose to scam artists. There is a question about confidence in the markets. There is a question about you know, how much do you want to make decisions for people based on individual liberty interests, which is a real value at issue here. And I think it is appropriate to draw a line and say we are just not going to step in at some point. Uh, but above that, I think that you have got to think more carefully about the effect on the structure of the markets and you know, what, let's say, a $10,000 exemption would do um, without the right kind of restrictions. 
And, my, and so the, the most specific answer would be, I think we, do, we need to move generally more into intermediary regulation as one of the solutions to capital raising. Okay. okay. And the second answer is, it has got to be kind of crowdfunding specific, which may, which may militate for changing the triggers for registering as a broker-dealer. As I mentioned in my testimony, that is pretty much an all-or-nothing game. My, my and time is short. So, Sorry. Uh, Ms. Moriello, Mr. Lynn, Mr. Neese, can you respond to this concern? I think if we are going to put in protections, which are apt, you are right, there is a balance to strike. The most effective party to be doing this, uh, this is not the facilitating party, it is the people themselves. So, for example, the way that purchasers are qualified now by, by uh, their net worth, whether they are accredited or unaccredited, is that really the best way to determine that someone can make a smart investment decision just based on how much money they have in the bank? I would argue not at all. So redefining what qualified investors are in the context of crowdfunding, I think, is an apt path to go. For example, the sophistication laws, great intention there, but if they are not defined, they can't be used. Define sophistication allows sophisticated investors, regardless of net worth, to be able to invest. Someone who is local should be a qualified purchaser. If I live next door to the coffee shop, I know more about that coffee shop than anybody else, regardless of how much money they have in the bank. I should be a qualified purchaser. If I know that person, so liberalizing what substantial preexisting relationship is, in the classmate example that I gave earlier, if we went to school together, I know more about you, regardless of what my net worth is, I should be a qualified purchaser. That is how I would prevent fraud as well. I think there, there are two key points here. One, in terms of what you know, the qualification to be allowed to invest, and I do, I, I agree with the previous comments, and just want to emphasize that, you know, r regardless of what the system has been since 1933, um, and regardless of whether we're opening up a broader debate here or not, there is a serious sort of over and under inclusiveness uh, to the accredited investor rules. It is a, 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 a loose proxy that has always been based on just you know, a very sort of loose cutoff. But it doesn't necessarily say anything about whether people are really qualified to invest, as Congressman, I believe you said earlier. One of the things we do on Cedars is before you can invest, you take a quiz. And the quiz is a multiple choice questionnaire, and it says things like most startups succeed or fail. Well, we think that people who can get through that, and it gets to dilution and a couple of other issues, we think most people who can get through that, that is a pretty good indicator, regardless of how much money they have, of whether they are able to make the, judge, uh, make, make the investment decision. On the fraud point, which is a little different, I mean, the, the qualification of investors is about whether you know your, the, the risks involved and are able to take them. On the fraud point, I disagree with you, Professor. I think that the amount of fraud that occurs in this marketplace among good crowdfunding platforms is actually going to be very minimal. In our case, we are going to have substantial legal protections in place, and we will go after very, very quickly and very publicly any entrepreneur who does try to defraud the investors. We will press criminal fraud charges against them, and we will quickly establish reputation as one of the least favorable places to try to run a scam. I think most other platforms are going to do very similar things, and this is going to be a, a market and an environment under which very little fraud occurs. It is yet to be seen, but that is our view. And I would agree with uh, Mr. Lin and disagree with the professor as well. I think, first and foremost, anyone that is going to register on these platforms is going to have to give over their personal information, Social Security number, address, date of birth, and they are going to have to go through a background check to see if they have committed any fraud. So, boom, if you have got a checkered history, you are out. Second of all, I personally believe most fraud to date has been committed on a one-to-one -one basis where you don't have this open network that we are advocating for on these platforms where the community can come together and give a combined opinion. Lots of voices are going to go into this, and that is going to whittle out people from um, committing fraud, and it is going to expose the people that are trying to take uh, advantage of people on these platforms. So I just think and a, th a third point, in an all-or-nothing fashion, which is what we are advocating on these platforms, you have to, have to raise the entire amount or you get no money. You have to hit, hit the bar pretty high and convince everyone before you get a dollar. Uh, Mr. Bullard, would you like to respond to, to any of those? Is there, is there some way to get some consensus about how we achieve this? Well, the, uh, the way to achieve it is you first have to start with the, you know, the member of the mafia who decides to become a broker-dealer and runs one of these businesses. I mean, if you want to have a discussion about what is going to happen, put them on the panel, because we are not talking about legitimate businesses and what they are going to do as a matter of business practice. What was just described here was business practices. If you want to write them into the law, then it will work, but they are not going to be part of the law. You say you are going to do certain checks? It's not not necessarily. That is that's so why I am asking right, so, to this so that's point. Why, so I, you know, I look from the perspective of what is the minimum necessary, and I think it is intermediary requirements. Where, that, where the burden has to be placed on an intermediary. There is no way you can make this function where you are always putting the burden on the issuer. That is just inconsistent with the whole idea of crowdsourcing. So, so. Mr. Bullard and Ms. Cross have, have mentioned this 
which is uh, establishing some criteria for intermediaries, right? That that would be the onus of regulation, and that would be sort of the initial view of how this could could work best. Right. If I if I could, I just want to be be clear. Uh, I was expressing my views. The commission hasn't um, taken this up yet, so. I view intermediary regulation as perhaps a cost-effective way, effective way to deal with this, because for an individual company raising $50,000, for example, putting all of the requirements on them may be cost prohibitive. The, if someone is running a site and, and is, for example, taking a 5 percent commission um, and is running a site where they are raising billions of dollars, perhaps, if it turned out great. Um, then they could afford uh, to, to deal with intermediary regulation, whereas the individual company raising fifty thousand might, that might be the harder question. That's just a personal view as to what might be a, a, a way forward. So, would they be broker dealers? The question of broker dealer registration um, requirements depends on what their functions are. Um, if they, uh, under the rules now, if they have a salesman stake, which is, um, for example, a commission for success. Um, and if they deal with client funds and securities, then they may come within the definition. Then you would have to look and see how would regulation work. If they are not engaging in those sorts of activities under the Federal securities laws, it is um, not clear that they would be broker-dealers. So and so then maybe you would come up with an alternative mechanism of regulation that is an oversight type role. It is an interesting question what would be the right way to approach it. So that broker-dealer status, Ms. Moriello, is that too onerous and expensive? Yes. So we did not take a sale. We have no salesman stake, no commission being charged. We are basically making no money and still we're we told that we need to be a broker-dealer? Yes, by, not by the SEC. Um, but so I do have experience You are being told that by your legal counsel? By the Department of Corporations in the State of California. So through that process, we did learn a lot from approaching many broker-dealers and trying to partner with their license and learned what their criteria was, and I think it's an important education. We were told across the board that it was not advantageous for them to work with us because our average deal size was under $50,000. So the requirements and the compliance that they would need to do as a broker-dealer, it would not behoove them to do deals that small. So unless we were willing to bring our deal size up to an average of, say, $5 million or more, they, they were not interested. So that's what we're trying to navigate now. Mr. Lynn, is that your experience in uh, Great Britain? Well, it is actually the opposite. And w without having a, a detailed knowledge of, of what is required of broker dealer registration, um, the FSA authorization process is a very flexible one that looks specifically at exactly what a business is doing and then imposes a series of requirements and regulations on it. So far, and I say this as a business that has not yet completed the process, um, that authorization process seems to have been a very happy medium for us. The costs are not very substantial. To give you a sense, the entire cost in preparing the application and filing it will be between 10 and 15,000 uh, pounds, and our ongoing costs will be something like 5,000 pounds a year, which is compared to our marketing and operating budgets aren't that overwhelming. Well, that is reasonable. It is, it is the SEC, it, it, it is the uh, question of being a broker-dealer. Uh, how many, how many broker-dealers do we have in the United States, roughly? I am going to have to um, get back to you um, with answers to those questions. That is the Trading and Markets Division, so I am not, I'm really not qualified to answer that question. I, you know, I think that um, uh, to the point but the of, cost is substantially more to be a broker dealer in the United States than. than I, I would assume so. I, I mean, I think that again, one of the points I was trying to make was that in in crafting a regulatory approach, if there isn't one that's already appropriate, you would you would perhaps be able to, depending on what the um, functions are of the an intermediary, um, craft regulation that fits best on a cost benefit basis. So I think it, it, it may be that it's scalable the way it is in in, in London. I think that that's a question that would need to be discussed. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Neese, in terms of your experience with this, uh, how how can we confront this issue of fraud? I mean, what, what's the legitimate way? We're looking for public policy here, and and that's the idea here. I mean, the whole panel. Uh, we have a minority witness. We have a witness from the SEC, and the whole panel is in. And agree, uh, well, I, Ms. Cross has not stated a, a, an opinion on, on that because that is a matter of SEC policy that she wouldn't come forward on, on that type of whether this is a good idea or not. So just to state that clearly, but even the minority witness uh, agrees that this idea of crowdfunding is a, is a worthy one. The structure of it really is the question here. 
And so I, I do want to get to the structural question. How do we uh, structurally allow this uh, to take place? Because this, having, be, having a conduit between small investors and uh, small businesses, I think, is a worthy one. It is not the full answer. I mean, you know, the, the whole idea here is, to, to Ms. Moriello's uh, testimony, was how do you get to that venture capital? Well, this might be the best way, getting, getting those initial 1,000 users of Facebook to put in a couple bucks so they can buy their first server. You know, that idea of crowdfunding to get something initially going, public markets are still, we want the public markets to function. We still want folks to, uh, you know, to, to have that opportunity. But how do you get that bridge there, uh, you know, from, from idea to, to rolling? Well, I think what you have to do is you have to put a structure in place which currently exists on the, the crowdfunding platforms that are out there. You have to register, and that requires that, like I said before, that you give certain information and then they run background checks on you. Then you sort of have to do the business model. You, let the, you have your business idea, you have got how it is going to make money, and that is where you let the crowd take over and let them decide which ideas they think are worthy. If they think it is worthy and it hits that funding target, then you have got certain mechanisms that are in place. You have got standardized subscription agreements and term sheets that can be used across the board to make it easier for everyone to communicate. And all of this happens on open platforms where there is this, um, this uh, communication channel that is freely uh, open to everyone. And I, I think the a critical thing to come back to, um, there is technology out there like um, on LinkedIn where you see the first three connectivity of an individual, what we are talking about here is community investment. It is people, it is me going to my friends and family, that first degree people. That is part of the anti-fraud that takes place. These are tools that are, are new but can be incorporated in there that people can see who are the first degree investors going in here. And the more percent of those that are going in there, the higher trust that you are going to have because those are the people that know and understand the entrepreneur, the investor, the entrepreneur, the idea, and the business model. So you know, in, in terms of a small group of fo folks, like on an individual basis, you could, it, it, do you have this belief that you can defraud five people, but it might be more difficult to defraud 50,000 people? Is that you, you in betcha. your mindset? I, so I started a, a company here based in uh, Washington, D.C., called FlavorX, and we flavored medicines for children. And I went the traditional route of raising money from people. And you know what? It wasn't easy. You have to convince, a, you have to talk to a lot of people about what it is that you're trying to do. And I probably could have taken advantage of a small group of people, my closest friends and family. I don't think I would have done that. Counterproductive. But um, the the more people I spoke to, the more people I had to convince, the harder it was. It's just it's a it's a nature of the beast. Mr. Land, is that your experience? Absolutely. The, the wisdom of the crowds is a very powerful thing, both in terms of vetting out fraud, sniffing out the mafia uh, broker-dealer, as well as being able to make good business judgments about the businesses. One of the, one of the key features and I, of our platform, I think this is true of most platforms uh, like ours, will be that you know, although we do run certain checks and although there is an intermediated process, we rely on the investors and the investors voting with their checkbooks in 200, 300, 500, 1,000 people at a time to make judgments. We think that is tremendously powerful. Uh, and it is, you know, um, uh, there has been discussion earlier about crowdsourcing in general. It really is a big part of the power of crowdsourcing. Mr. Bullard, in terms of this functionality of this, if you, if you have registered intermediaries, perhaps at a reasonable cost basis to do it with some oversight. Um, would, th would that, is that more palatable to you? Is that, you know, how would you structure crowdfunding? If we said, went with the President's plan and said, you know, to raise up to a million dollars and you have a limitation on a percentage of annual income, or uh, what, what would that look like? What, what would that dollar amount of limitation on the amount you could raise, the limitation on the individual, if you believe in that, or if you, if you think that is the right approach, how would you structure this thing um, if, if you were, were designing not just the legislation, but the, the rules for the SEC? Just walk through that with us. If, uh, well, first if you would, would, indulge okay. me with that. If, yeah. you, if you don't wish to, I mean, I, I understand. I, when asked to you know, rule the universe, I am always happy to respond. <laughs> um, the, the first thing I would do is to create two tracks, and one I would call the de minimis track. 
eliminate virtually all of the regulation at the registration reporting level and agree on what is the amount where you are going to allow somebody to, let's say, blow 250 bucks on a dream, and even if it is a scam artist, we are just not going to go there with registration and reporting. And as you pointed out, we do that you know, in commercial environments all the time. People lose money that way in lots of different scenarios. There is nothing about the securities market that I think justifies changing that. It is important to keep it on a second track to protect it from all of the burdens that should be applied when it is something other than de minimis. So then I would say, okay, let's do our traditional analysis. Use an intermediary for the efficiency reasons that Meredith was describing. They can, on a one-time basis, incur the fixed cost of compliance that cannot be distributed to all of the crowdfunders. So there is no other way to really effectuate true crowdfunding unless you have that centralization of the fixed costs. Then I would say, what is your issuer exemption? If you have the accredited investor standard under 506, nothing new is needed for the broker-dealer. But if you have something, let's say, like your bill, then what I would add to it would be, okay, you want to be a broker-dealer that sells these kinds of issuer securities, here are the things you need to do it. An audit is an idea, but I question whether an audit is going to be feasible for somebody raising only $10,000. I think the quiz idea is an interesting one because it really goes to not the, I don't think it goes to the sophistication of the investor. I think what it goes to is the expectations of the investor. And social policy is ultimately driven by whether when people lose their shirts, they feel that you should have prevented it from happening. That is an important aspect of social policy. So I also like the idea of the wisdom of crowds. But just to you know, give an example, the wisdom of crowds assumes that you have a rule in place that requires what they are apparently doing, which is you have to get a minimum number of people to get to a minimum amount. I like those kinds of innovative approaches to achieving compliance in a different way from the way the SEC really even thinks about it. But the, but the point is, that has to be a rule, because if it is not a rule, the person is going to go in not subject to the wisdom of crowds and only get to the $3,339 and then we put it in a bank account somewhere and disappear off the Internet. Um, so, and, and as far as the, you know, the ability to commit a fraud in the Internet, I, I mean, I, I, I wish that the SEC's Internet uh, fraud person, for which they have a specific office, were here, uh, because they would just flatly contradict what we are being told about what goes on in legitimate Internet-based marketplaces. The, the amount of fraud the Internet is being used for is, is rampant. It is the ideal vehicle. If I were trying to create a fraud, I would love the opportunity to use the Internet to do what some of the proposals that are on the table to do, because that is precisely the way to raise millions of dollars from 50,000 people. So why don't we simply, from, for securities purposes, ban the use of the Internet? Because the Internet is also an incredibly valuable tool for raising capital. I mean, okay. It's, so, so it's a balance. So what you do is you, just, you, you have only portals that have satisfied certain requirements being the places where you can do this. And you also put it in the responsibility on the portal slash broker dealer, which is the optimal from an efficiency point of view to place place to place responsibilities. But the problem is broker dealers will unite and say, "Oh, we don't want this responsibility," and that's what you're hearing from uh, Ms. Moriello. It's it's an institutional difference where they'd rather have the issuers bear that risk, but it's not efficient. Well, Ms. Moriello, I'll let you respond to that. So I think something that's come up is the wisdom of the crowds for, for this protection and, and how that works versus broker-dealer. One slight variation that we have on that is around the qualification of purchasers. So what made us feel very safe in our issuers and purchasers feel very safe is that everybody knew each other. This was truly communities. And so I think there is a variation on crowdfunding, which is community funding, which is what we instituted, where you had to verify as the issuer when you invited the purchaser. I do know you, and I know you in this way. We went to school together, and the purchaser had to verify, yes, we did go to school together, so I, can, I know about your character, I know about your acumen, and then you were doing the investing. At no point did we allow for the general public or for strangers to be able to invest. So that is how, that's how we got around, or not how we got around, but how we addressed, in most part, this fraud issue. We also went through background checks, the other thing that Mr. Nice has recommended, but the fact that you actually, both parties know each other, I think, is the most important starting place, and then you can grow from there on reputation. If a fee structure were similar to what Mr. Lynn discussed, and grant, granted, you know, the pound uh, to dollar conversion uh, changes that slightly, but not to a greater degree. Let's say it's a $10,000 registration with the SEC. Is that something bearable? Sure. It is not the upfront costs that are, that are problematic at all. It is the ongoing due diligence requirements and ongoing compliance requirements that are necessary for the small deals. So there, I would have no problem paying an upfront fee, and that is the nature of fundraising and making that happen. But it is how much due diligence I am responsible for, for even the smallest, de minimis, if you will, deals that are happening on the site. Okay. If I could add just one, one point. Um, 
I mean, Ms. Morello is exactly right about the burdens of broker-dealer regulation in the U.S., and Mr. Lin pointed out one of the differences in the U.K. that we just don't have the flexibility to say, well, let's see what you are actually doing here and regulate as a broker-dealer on that basis. It is pretty much an all-or-nothing system, in contrast with the regulation of exchanges. The SEC has been very innovative. You haven't heard anybody complain about being treated as an exchange, which is the same kind of issue that arises with respect to being a broker-dealer, because there is an SEC exemption that applies. So what, you know, the solution to, to Ms. Moriello's problem and Mr. Lin's problem is to have more sensitive broker-dealer regulation that mm -hmm. says, well, if you are only doing this and this is your business model, this is what we want you to do in return, especially yeah. if, and this is key, if the custody of assets component is removed from their responsibility then you have eliminated a huge amount of broker-dealer regulation. It is my understanding all of these models put custody somewhere else. And custody is the root of many problems with fraud, custody meaning the person who actually holds the dollars. That was the Madoff problem. That is really the problem with many broker-dealer abuses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, this question of fraud, though, is interesting because you met Mr. Bullard. I was going to respond to you before I recognize Ms. Moriello, because the, the idea that the Internet is a perfect conduit for fraud, um, it, well, let us be honest about it. Let us shoot straight. Uh, taking advantage of one person is much more, uh, uh, you are much more able to do that rather than take advantage of a thousand people. Do you, do you I mean, is that, uh, because, I, because the example I would use is the eBay, you have the exchange of very valuable goods. Um, and individuals get to look at that seller and that seller's recommendation and all the information about it. So you have some confidence with certain people, there is no confidence with others, and the thing shakes itself out, versus the individual who in a parking lot purchased an iPad that turned out to be a piece of wood, right? I mean, so fraud does occur. I mean, we we've had extensive uh, you know, the SEC has been around for 80 years and provided a wonderful function and a wonderful amount of uh, safety and security and disclosure and, and all that. Um, but we also had Madoff. And you also had individuals following Madoff that submitted information to the SEC. So there is some wisdom in crowds. There is some wisdom in crowds. D but to the question of, of, that you mentioned before, which is, uh, you know, is the SEC there to mandate disclosures? or to prevent dumb people from doing dumb things, you know, for being taken advantage of from front, which is a larger ideological question. You mentioned it in, in those terms, and I think that is reasonable. I have got a couple other questions that I want to uh, hit, and, um, and I am not sure if we have uh, the full uh, uh, ranking member from the full committee returning, but uh, I want to make sure he has the opportunity to ask questions if he does. Um, so you all have different approaches. Um, so how important is, is it for the SEC to create flexibility and recognize the different models all have some valuable attributes? And we will start with Mr. Bullard and, and work backwards. Uh, well, again, just to, uh, I have been using too much time already, just again to reiterate, I think the two tracks approach, one of them being a de minimis approach, is, is the way to really move the ball on this and make progress, at least for those who are uh, more into the, the kind of original crowdsourcing approach, where it is almost a form of social activism, where you have the investing uh, going on. Uh, and then second, I think we have got to look at this as an intermediary issue for efficiency reasons, so that you can allow crowdsourcing to maximize its potential. You have got to place the burdens on the portal, on the central point. But you've, and then you have to look at the issuer, the burdens you want to relieve issuers of. You then have to convert them into a broker-dealer context and figure out well, what do we need to replace those with that broker-dealers can do much more efficiently and do better. And what you're hearing is a description of models that they've chosen to adopt that work very well. I wish, I do wish the SEC would be much more creative about looking at the kinds of ways that eBay's and these websites establish trust and confidence that are not really reflected in the securities laws at all. Um, the, the way I see this is, is that this, I, I believe that having this wide open would allow small businesses absolutely to where you have a, a possibility of, let's say, going to an SBA. It's almost impossible to get a loan from an SBA if you're a small up-and-coming business. Uh, this would allow you that access. Uh, I truly believe that we need to maintain some openness on this. Transparency is key. I will have to say that. Uh, constant communication is key. Uh, and you will end up with, with uh, 
there is no way to prevent for absolute fraud. There is going to be some cases that are going to slip through, but I truly do believe that transparency is absolutely something that will keep clear on what we need to do. Um, listen, fraud, investor protection, investor protection and capital formation were the three things that we looked at at our August 1st symposium that we held in San Francisco where we brought thought leaders together, lawyers, professors, all interested parties, uh, even some crowdfunding sites, to work out our framework in the startup exemption that literally crafts the rules under which another exemption, a different like a rule of 507 that would allow this to happen. And it addresses all of these points. So it is in my written testimony. Thank you. I think in answer to the question about the need for a flexible form of regulation, absolutely. As I say, uh, we have benefited, I think, from uh, the flexible approach that the FSA takes, and I have no doubt that there is a way, I don't know what it is, but there has got to be a way to design some form of intermediary regulation that is not as burdensome as a broker-dealer, but that nonetheless addresses a lot of these issues. And as I said in my testimony, I do support some level of intermediary regulation. I think it is and can be the most effective way to make this market work. I will also add one quick other point in response to Mr. Bullard. Uh, you know, if, in terms of having a separate regime specifically for de minimis investments, if, if when we are talking de minimis we are talking about $100 or $250, don't bother. The, 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 I mean, it's, it's, there is just no point in putting it in place. It, the market will never function. Deals won't get done, uh, and we are all wasting our time. If de minimis is $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, I am not sure that I support that, but it becomes a little bit more feasible. But if we are really expecting uh, crowdfunding platforms to function on the basis of $100, $250 caps, it is a waste of time. Even though they are already functioning in the debt markets on precisely that basis? It is simply not going to happen for equity investments in startups. People aren't going to be investing that small of an amount. It is very different with peer-to-peer -peer lending when you, have, when you have constant returns and the constant cycle of, 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 um, of, of interest payments. There will be, a, I should say, I should clarify, there will be a lot of people who will invest at that level, just not a sufficient number in any given investment, given the nature of equity, given the importance of high upside versus, you know, you know high upside versus losses on, in most cases. You know, the, the deals just won't get completed. We have done a lot of research around it, and that is what, that's what we found. I, I would concur with that point for what it is worth. And I would add two more that haven't been mentioned already about some flexibility in rulemaking, which would be very useful. The first one, which is in the, the bill that you proposed, is national preemption. And although we have automated all the state-by-state -state laws, it is extremely difficult to build a scalable platform to facilitate these things if all of the states can put in their own laws on top of this. So I would very strongly advocate and support what you have said about national preemption. And secondarily, the most important thing for a lot of the businesses that are using these functions is that they can raise more capital later, as you said. This is not the end-all, be-all to capital formation. This is step one. So ensuring that the rules that are put in place play well together with the other rules. So, for example, if you are doing a 504 raise and you can only raise up to a million dollars and you want to raise a VC round six months later, you, you can't. You have, to, you have to wait that appropriate period of time. So I would encourage that to be taken into account with rulemaking as well. Okay. Ms. Cross, I, I, let me state the question in a different way because I understand the limitations uh, you have as, uh, uh, as an, an employee of the SEC. And, and so I know it is a unique position, but you have you've always done very well testifying before Congress and being forthright uh, you know, as, uh, based on those constraints. And I, and I do appreciate that. Um, so is the SEC currently looking at recognizing the different models uh, in terms of broker-dealers, you know, that type of model, uh, and providing some level of flexibility? Um, what I would say is, um, and, I, and I appreciate your kind remarks, thank you. Um, what I would say is that the, at, the, at the staff level, as we have been thinking through what would be the best way to advise our Commission, um, we have talked about the fact that there may be a need to have scalable um, regulatory approaches and, and, frankly, to think about this creatively. So, yes, from the staff level perspective, we have been having meetings um, pretty regularly recently to talk through what would be the safest way to roll this out if, if the Commission were to decide that it wanted to do it um, on a cost-effective basis. And questions around, depending on what the role is of the intermediary, could you make the regulation of it scalable so that it is cost effective? Is, is, uh, ha have you looked at the FSA model in Great Britain? 
Um, I read all about it last night, <laughs> and um, I thought it was fascinating, actually, and I looked forward to, to discussing it with Mr. Lin, and um, we, I took his card, and I, I think it will be very helpful to hear what the experience is there. I think that is a, that's a fascinating approach um, that gives me less pause than the idea of having what, what really does scare me is the idea of people just opening up sites, stealing people's money, closing the sites, and, you know, they are not, in, they're not even in our country. They are someplace else, and, and, and set up fake businesses, and everybody, you know, puts in their several hundred dollars, and it is just gone. I think that would be a real shame and, and would tar this market. And so the, the approach that the FSA, that he described for the FSA sounds quite interesting. Okay. Even with that great diligence provided by the SEC, fraud still does occur. And so, you know, I, I, I think it is important that the SEC keep in mind um, the, the cost-benefit analysis of potential lost profits uh, and lost opportunities at, at the same time. But, um, you know, is there, it, well, what are the SEC's regulations on peer-to-peer on -peer lending? Um, first of all, I need, to, I need to start by saying that I'm, I'm, I used to represent one of the two large peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Uh, before I came to the SEC. So I am recused on talking about particular peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Um, the regulations that are currently being complied with by the peer-to-peer -peer lenders um, uh, require that they file registration statements to register, register their securities um, at, that are backed by the notes that mm -hmm. um, come from the individual borrowers. And um, I believe that they are not regulated as broker-dealers. I believe that they, um, there are alternative trading systems that are associated with the peer-to-peer -peer lenders where the members can trade the notes. Um, and that, uh, the ATS, is, is run by a broker-dealer. But the site itself, I believe the money runs through a bank. People put their money in a bank, and so there isn't any concern that the money will be stolen. Um, and and that is how it is done. Okay. And so that, that is to Mr. Bullard's point of, of uh, who actually possesses the assets in the transaction. Right. It is in a bank, yeah. is my understanding. Yeah. Okay. And, and so that model is different than a broker-dealer model for that peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, uh, site or company. Yeah. That is right. It is, they are not, they, they not um, registered as broker-dealers, is my understanding. It has been two years since I have been back to the Commission, so I have not paid attention to what they have been doing lately, but right. that was what the model was in the past. Okay. Okay. So, um, Mr. Lynn, you mentioned something earlier that I wanted to touch on, which is you said that larger investors should be permitted to invest along smaller, alongside smaller investors. Why? Why, why do you think that is worthy, beneficial, proper? Well, well getting, getting to the point I made about the problem with the de minimis exemption, the, the key here is if we think crowdfunding is a good thing and if we would like to see these platforms function effectively in the market, the deals have to get completed. And I am operating under the assumption that most platforms will work on an all or nothing basis, as ours will. It is not going to be very appealing to investors to risk putting a few hundred dollars into a business and then finding that the business has it but can't do anything because it didn't raise the rest. So assuming that these are $50,000, $100,000, maybe more, two fifty, five hundred dollars uh, capital raises, uh, they need to get completed for the businesses to be able, for, 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 for crowdfunding platforms to be able to function. And our view, based on our research, is that the way they will get completed will be through a mix of high, a high volume of smaller investors alongside a number of larger investors being able to invest $1,000, 5000 10000 potentially even $50,000. Um, and that what you will see in the spread across, and, and you do see this to some degree with peer-to-peer -peer lending already, but we think it will be more pronounced given the nature and, and appetite for risk in the equity markets, in the private equity, um, uh, private companies. Uh, we think that the way that deals will get done, uh, and the only way that they will get done, is if you have some larger investors in there. As I said in response to the ranking member earlier, y you could set up a bifurcated system if you wanted to, but there isn't really a whole lot of benefit in doing so, and it, it, it adds additional administrative burden. And in fact, by having larger investors come in on our platform, they are going to go through the, same, the exact same qualifications, the exact same screening that our smaller investors do. So if anything, they get an additional level of protection. Does, does the President's proposal of limiting it to a million dollars uh, raise, does that provide significant investor protection? No. I mean, I, I, I don't know that it necessarily does. I think in terms of, 
you know, switching from the size of investment per investor to the size of, of, of raise per business, um, it is difficult for me to foresee a whole lot of online crowdfunding successes at much above a million dollars. It is not to say that they won't happen. Certainly, the PBR case is a great exception and there will be others. Um, our view is that the sweet spot in this market you know, is at, hundred in, in Britain, 100,000 pounds or less, here maybe $100,000 or 250 or, or less, um, and that that is partially because that is where, you know, once you get above those levels, that is where venture capitalists become more active. There are a lot of other routes to capital. So we don't see a tremendous amount of detriment to a million-dollar cap. Um, but I'm not sure I see the advantage to it either necessarily. Ms. Moriella, do you see it the same way? I would agree. Our, our sweet spot is around 50,000. And it, it, again, it's two different markets. I, I do think that there's going to be a, some really outstanding cases. Even on Kickstarter, there have been outstanding cases of raising a million or more, and I applaud those, and those are wonderful. But I do think the bulk of the market is going to be in that fifty dollars to $100,000 range. Okay. Mr. Nees? All I want to add to that is I agree that it is the $50,000 range, but I think the whole point of having the million dollar in there is if you are successful at $50,000 and that is your proof of concept and you need to go out and grow it from there, you can go back and show the crowd what you did with that $50,000, be held accountable to that $50,000 in an open, transparent platform, and then go out and raise $250,000 under this framework up to a million dollars to really get it going. And I think the most critical thing is the most successful companies that come out of this will be the breeding grounds for the VCs and the private money. Okay, so uh, to go right back through the three of you as well, the, the limitation, 10 percent of your income or $10,000, do you think that is uh, wise, uh, a wise limitation? It is the President's proposal, uh, which is also in the legislation that I, that I filed yesterday. Absolutely. I think it is very wise to have a limit there. I would propose that the limit on percentage is, uh, is going to be more protected than the dollar limit. The dollar limit is going to be outdated very quickly and constantly need to be updated, whereas the percentage limit will always hold. And I agree with Mr. Lynn that it is we have seen the 80-20 rule in place, that you do need to have a few investors who are going to carry the bulk of this, and they might be investing more than 10000 if that is you know, less than 10 or even less than 5 percent of their net worth. I, I agree 100 percent. I think that the a percentage-based limitation is fine. Our own is 20 percent of the investor's net worth in aggregate across the platform, 10 percent of income. I think that is all arguable. I don't see the value, or, and I, I see a lot of detriment in a dollar limit. Okay. Uh, uh, we are in favor. We actually had it in our exemption initially, and we took it out because we thought the self-reporting on it was just we left it up to the person to be responsible with what they wanted to invest. Mr. Bullard? Um, yeah, I just there's. I think uh, Mr. Lynn just misunderstands my proposal. Uh, no, no, no. If, I, I wish you you'd answer the, the question I just posed, which is because, the the ten thousand dollar or ten percent of your income cap. Is do you think that's sufficient or appropriate? Um, no, I would take I would draw a paternalistic line at someone uh, living below the poverty line not being allowed to put thousand or fifteen hundred dollars into an offering over the internet without substantial additional protections through an intermediary platform other than those just voluntarily adopted by the firm. Okay. Okay. But I would draw an income level, you know, maybe it's 50000 I think it, I agree completely with the structural absurdity of the current accredited investor standard. We can fix that, but going all the way down to, you know, persons with $10,000 in income, I think that is a mistake. Okay. Mr. Migliosi, how does it make you feel when, when these three crowd funders to your right say that, you know, it is going to be about fifty to $100,000 you can raise, and with an idea you had, you got uh, $200 million of, of commitment. 282. Million. Oh, 282. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, this is um, this particular case is obviously a think big uh, with the you know a crowdsourcing uh, a brewery. Um, I think limitations is going to limit business growth uh, on the amounts. I think that having the opportunity. To allow businesses to um, be able to get that brass ring, go a little bit further, those opportunities should be there. Uh, I, I, I don't see why we'd want to artificially hold back entrepreneurs from getting from point A to point B uh, and then be able to put themselves into the larger investment market at some point. So I, I would say that my opinion, obviously. Uh, think bigger. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, final, you know, I'm wrapping up here, just so everyone, for planning purposes, 
um, in terms of what the economic impact would be if we follow the President's proposal? Um, you know, uh, can you go through and just give me your estimate? And we'll start with you, Mr. Bullard. And well, you know, I think you would see um, a substantial increase in fundraising over the Internet uh, under that approach. There is no question. It would, it would assist capital formation. It would give investors more options than they currently have. Uh, and it would be a kind of liberalization that I think would be a good thing to some extent. Uh, but I think it would also would, uh, as, as described in his proposal, which is this unadorned $10,000 know, limit, um, it would open the door to a substantial amount of fraud. Uh, I think it would inappropriately sort of eliminate any kind of cutoff as to the sophistication and or income of the person investing in unregistered securities. Okay. No comment. Mr. Neese. I, I, just, I just think preventing investment doesn't equal preventing fraud. Um, and the only protection that we can give is an informed investor, and that is going to come through education in an open, transparent platform. I think if we get the capital flowing based on our projections, we can create 500,000 companies over the next five years and employ 1.5 million jobs, net new jobs. Okay. Mr. Lyon? I mean, in, in, in terms of economic impact, I can just tell you our estimates for Britain, which you can then multiply by five based on population and maybe assume a slightly higher entrepreneurial appetite here. Um, you know, in, in Britain, we plan at scale to be able to see 1,000 to 2,000 new businesses funded per year. Um, of those, we assume that somewhere between 20 and 40 percent will actually turn into something um, and create some number of jobs. Uh, and you can work backward from there to think about the sort of economic impact. And that is our platform alone. There will be other competitors out there, other businesses starting. We see a vast level of nascent entrepreneurship in Britain, in Europe, in the United States and around the world where people would love to start a new business, have value creating ideas, but don't have the access to the very first capital they need. And we think that platforms like this can help them overcome that hurdle and be absolutely transformative for an economy. Ms. Mariella? I absolutely agree. One of the statistics that got us most excited about the potential for change in this industry is that over $100 billion currently transacts between friends and family in informal investing networks every year. It is the second most common way of starting your business after your personal credit card, which you mentioned yourself. So I see a tremendous potential to both you know, putting more protections on that market, which currently has no protections. Those are checks across the dinner table that nothing is um, nothing's happening around and growing it substantially. The capital is there. It just needs to be accessed. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I, I do appreciate it. It is very helpful in terms of forming policy. Um, there is some give and take here, but I think uh, uh, the input has been just absolutely fantastic. And unfortunately, you are here on one of the mornings where uh, Congress had about 20 different things going on. So uh, we have had, uh, uh, and so that, that has been the attendance question here this morning. It, um, the subject matter is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I look at my father's example where he had a, a great idea and a business partner. He had five kids and he had a, a, a garage in the backyard. And um, so he's looking for money to feed those five kids. He had an idea with his business partner uh, who also had five kids who was looking for money too. The only way they could uh, get lending was through that new invention called the credit card. And uh, I still have my father's credit card that he founded his business on. Uh, today, my brother owns that business and runs that business with my father's business partner, and he employs about 400 people. Um, that is the, the, the beauty of innovation in small businesses. Um, we want to make sure that those folks have opportunities um, to take their idea from the dinner table out to the markets. And, and so much of the focus and discussion has been about the accredited investor. You are talking about the, the, folk, the, the guy, Mr. Bullard, in your testimony. You mentioned this, and I certainly appreciate that. I very much appreciate it. You have a million dollars in net worth. You are an accredited investor, so you have got great access to startup companies. So Facebook uh, and a lot of these tech companies had these folks that had access to it, whereas the average investor, even the superior investor who doesn't have that high net worth, doesn't have that same opportunity. And I want to make sure, and it is my thought, to democratize this process, to give those small investors the opportunity for that upside potential, not simply to make a contribution to a worthy charity um, over the Internet, but to get the upside in this. And that is the point of my legislation. Now, the structure of this is, I think, 
the, the point of discussion today, to make sure that we have a proper st structure so you can root out fraud to the best of our abilities. Um, but uh, making sure that investors have information and access to make an investment are both very worthy things that I would hope that the SEC uh, would look diligently at, and we intend here in Congress to move forward on that as well. Thank you for your time. If you have additional remarks, you may submit it for the record, and members will have up to seven uh, days to submit uh, questions for the record and comments for the record. And with that, the committee stands adjourned.